Those of you who watch this channel regularly will know that I absolutely love finding new flat earthers to respond to. And today I found one who's very stubborn. Her name is Ashley, she is deeply religious, and she wants to lead us all to salvation through flat earth. Hello all and welcome along to another video with me, Simon Dan. Thanks very much for joining me. Now before we begin today, a quick update on the Simon Dan Book Club. We have just passed 300 founding members. Thank you to everyone who's joined so far. If this is something that interests you as well, the link is in the description. The first box ships in March where you'll get a book, a science book curated by me. Loads of goodies in the box as well as loads of online goodies too. And in the first box, 10 random copies of the book have been signed by the author. So you may get lucky and bag yourself one of those. But don't worry, if you're a founding member, you will get a bonus founding member gift in the first box. As I said, check it out. The link's in the description or go to simandanbookclub.com. Right then, on with today's video, which comes from a lady called Ashley Hayes. She has a lot to say about Flat Earth and she is adamant that she's right. Let's hear her out, shall we? Now let's move on and get a little more technical and actually analyze flat earth a little deeper. So one of the common questions that I saw was how is earth not round? How is earth not a ball when all the other planets are? Well, first, there are no other planets. When God reveals flat earth to you, you, you truly have to, in a very literal sense, let go of everything you've been taught. And that includes all of the images that NASA has shown you. Here's the issue. You don't need NASA for planets to exist. You can observe them yourself through a telescope from your own back garden. Which begs the question, what the hell am I looking at then when I see planets through my own telescope with my own eyes? Now the word planet in the Greek actually means wandering star. God created this flat level earth and then he created other stars. Luminaries which are in the firmament and they circle above us. So think of it kind of like a clock that is laid down on a flat surface. Now, for everybody who relies on images, okay, so you're having a hard time with flat earth because you have seen pictures of other planets, clearly. Not just pictures, actual planets with my own eyes, as I said, Ashley. I want to show you this image. Okay, the, the description on this image was, it's a picture of Proxima Centurio, the nearest star to the sun. So it's located 4.2 light years away from us. It was taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. He says this level of detail, a new world is unveiled every day. But as it turns out, they admitted that it was just a piece of chorizo, a literal piece of meat. They are telling you that their images are, well, BS. What she's referring to here is a joke image that did the rounds online. A slab of chorizo labeled as a star as a joke. It was never an official James Webb Space Telescope release. No admission, no retraction, just people confusing a meme with reality. So when she says they admitted it was a piece of meat, what she really means is, I saw a meme, didn't check it, and then decided the entire field of astronomy has collapsed. Just like their image of the moon in front of the Earth. Remember this light? I talked about this in my first video. If this is a real picture of the moon in front of the Earth, what is that? This image comes from Discover Epic. And Epic does not take a single color photo. It takes multiple black and white images through different filters, seconds apart, which are then combined into color. That green edge is a color channel misalignment artifact. The moon is moving relative to Earth in between shots. When those frames are stacked, the limb doesn't line up perfectly. So one color channel peeks out at the edge. Green just happens to be the most obvious here. They are fabricated to promote the narrative of space and planets because this world needs to contradict the Bible. And I'll give you a perfect example. So here is a zoomed in view of the quote, planet Venus. Zoomed in and out of focus, I might add, but please carry on. This doesn't look like a physical planet, does it? It looks like a luminary with the ripples of water in front. Yes, because it's out of focus and the light is traveling through the turbulent atmosphere of Earth. God separated the waters from the waters. We are literally seeing evidence of God's word right in front of us. 
Nope, still an out-of-focus planet, I'm afraid. Here's what happens if you use the right equipment and take a photo of Venus that is in focus. Here is a map of the luminaries' paths. You can, everybody can look this up. This is the actual paths that they take above our Earth. It's intentional. It's beautiful. It's made with design from a creator. Modern science, though, wants you to believe in disorder, in chance. But the creator made a perfectly synchronized system, a clock, that Genesis 114 explains. He says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be, here it is, for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and years. When she says perfectly synchronized, she's just describing what we already observe on a globe. Regular motion governed by gravity and conservation laws. Order does not equal design. A pendulum is predictable too, but no creator is required mid-swing. Modern science does not argue for disorder. It explains why patterns exist. Seasons come from axial tilt, days from rotation, years from orbit. You can calculate all of it, centuries from forward to back. To the second, I might add. Quoting the book of Genesis does not turn scripture into a geometric model. It tells you meaning, not mechanics. The moment you try and use it as orbital physics, it stops working. Our Earth is flat while the stars rotate above us as a clock. They are set in intentionally patterned motions by our Creator with purpose. 1 Corinthians 15, 41. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. There are no physical planets. There are stars, there are luminaries, and a lot of them, probably the majority, if not all, are actually angels. But there are no physical planets. Now saying the stars rotate above us like a clock is not a model, it's more of a metaphor. There's no mechanism, no geometry, no explanation for why stars rotate in different directions in different hemispheres, or why their apparent motion changes with latitude. A single rotating dome fails immediately. And quoting Corinthians doesn't change that. Scripture describes meaning and symbolism. You can't calculate star positions or seasons or eclipses from a Bible verse, but you can from orbital mechanics, and we do. And notice the pattern again. When evidence becomes unavoidable, it's redefined as spiritual. Not tested, not measured, just renamed. Now, another common question that people had was, well, why aren't people running into the edge? If the earth is flat, why aren't we seeing people all the time running into the edge of it? So let's think about this for a second. Whenever you travel, wherever you go, your destination is what? Work, the grocery store, another town, another country, right? It's never the edge of the world. So unless you are intentionally trying to go to the edge of the world, which people have and they come up missing, you're not going to find it. People do intentionally go where this edge is supposed to be. They sail and fly and cross oceans consistently. There's commercial routes, military routes, research routes, and of course, independent expeditions. And also her logic is backwards here. We don't avoid the edge because we're not trying. We avoid it because it isn't there. On a globe, you can travel in one direction and never hit an edge. That matches reality perfectly. The Earth is contained by a surrounding ice wall, which is Antarctica. Our maps are a lie. Surprise, surprise. Antarctica isn't a continent. It is the container. And there is a reason why there is something called the Antarctic Treaty, which we'll get to in detail in a second. A hundred pounds she hasn't actually read the Antarctic Treaty. Bet you. Let's skip to where she mentions it, shall we? Countries from around the world can't agree on much. But they sure can come together and pass this treaty that says you can't step foot on that landmass. It enforces a no expedition from sea and no fly zone from air restriction to ensure that no one explores. Yes, you can visit, but they take you to a very small area. You've just said you can't step foot on that landmass. And then you said you can visit, but they take you to a very small area. Which one is it? The Antarctic Treaty does not ban exploration. It bans military activity and terrestrial claims. That is it. Science, tourism, private expeditions, sailing, flying, all allowed with permits 
for environmental protection. There's permanent research stations run by dozens of countries and thousands of tourists visit every year. So as expected, you did not read the Antarctic Treaty. Would have been the easiest hundred pound ever made that. Now, even though Admiral Byrd was believed to be a 33 degree Mason, he sadly and coincidentally died shortly after this interview. Now, because he is, he was a Mason, it raises some questions for some people. It is my opinion that either he truly did die because he shared too much information or this was their revelation of the method, right? This was their way of telling us what is really there and they made it look like he, you know, was taken out when he really was just taken into, you know, protective custody or whatever they do. Either way, the conclusion is the same they are revealing to us what is really there. First, Admiral Byrd did not die shortly after that interview. He died in 1957 at the age of 68 after a very long and public career. That was three years after that interview. Secondly, the 33 degree Mason claim is irrelevant here. Even if it was true, membership levels don't turn diary events into secret confessions. And they certainly don't transform speculation into evidence. And then comes the unfalsifiable fork. Either he was killed for telling the truth, or he was secretly protected whilst pretending to be killed. Notice how both options magically lead to the same conclusion. Now there's also a sad and kind of coincidental story about his son. His son, Bird Jr., who is also an ex-naval officer, gets on a train to travel to a National Geographic ceremony where he's scheduled to give a speech commemorating his father's expedition. Now he was also going to talk on the diary, uh, his dad's diary that he had found. Instead, he disappears and was found dead in a warehouse. Richard Byrd Jr. did not disappear on the way to a speech. He was not traveling to a National Geographic ceremony. That has been entirely invented. Now he died in 1988, 30 years after his father. And he was found in a warehouse in Baltimore, but his death was officially ruled as suicide. No missing person mystery, no silencing. My word, this is all a big bag of nonsense, isn't it? And I think that's where we're gonna leave Ashley for today. Super confidently wrong, isn't she? Please do let me know in the comments below what you thought of Ashley's video. Uh, as I say, we're all done and dusted for another one. And also, if you'd like to see more of her, as well let me know thanks so much for watching today as ever if you enjoyed it please do consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the thumbs up button too i've been simon dan have yourselves a great day and i'll see you tomorrow for part two of eric debay's proof apparently that the earth doesn't move see you then